All right, welcome everyone. And today, uh, Asian philosophy meetup. Okay, we will we will talk about Kumarajima and the Chinese Buddhism. All right. So before that, let me go through the schedule. I have a few changes on the schedule. So I kind of lay out the schedule up to uh, uh, to the uh, 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 October. So today we will talk about the Chinese. Today we will talk about uh, Chinese Buddhism and the, the person we were going to introduce is Kumarajiba. And a lot of people may not recognize how important he is. And then next week, we are going to continue to follow the book from Feng Yulan, A Short History of Chinese Philosophy, uh, talking about the Zen Buddhism, uh, even his translation called Chen, uh, basic, the pop, uh, I should not say proper name, but basic, the popular name is Zen, Zen Buddhism. And in uh, September 10th, we're going to <coughs> use uh, Xuan Zhang, Okay, that's the one James just talking about, and Alex uh, in, uh, is interested on uh, is Xuanzang. And then on uh, 17th, uh, we will talk about uh, Vedanta, okay, free will and the determination from uh, uh, SK, okay, so Hindu philosophy, which is uh, continuous from the uh, last, the last week discussion. And then I'm going to introduce, since we're moving through the history, and then we are now in about the sixth, seventh century, which is Tang Dynasty. So on the, the last week of September, I'm going to introduce the uh, background of the uh, Tang Dynasty, which is very interesting dynasty, and the Buddhism is uh, important uh, in this uh, uh, dynasty and the Xuanzang is live in the, uh, this uh, uh, this dynasty. And uh, October, uh, Alex is going to talk about the art and the philosophy of Chinese calligraphy. Okay. So uh, I believe she will talk about the person. His name is Wang Xizhi, and who lived during the same period of time. We will mention about. We will mention about his daughter. I think. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, and so that, 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 that's the schedule. Okay. And then, so today we will talk, the subject is Chinese Buddhism and uh, uh, Kumarajiva. So uh, two things I'd like to make it clear, okay? That's con uh, constantly being confused, okay? So Chinese Buddhism is different than Buddhism in China. Okay, let's put this, this one. I think Feng Yulan's book make it clear. Chinese Buddhism basically is talking about the religion, Buddhism religion in China, which basically is um, Mahayana Buddhism. Buddhism in China basically is talking about Xuanzang, bring the uh, Buddhism from India to China, which is written in Chinese, but this or has no Chinese flavor. Okay. So that, that's the two things, okay, it's different. And the two person constantly got confused is Kumarajiva and the Xuanzang. Uh, Kumarajiva, Kumarajiva is 200 years earlier than Xuanzang. Uh, Kumarajiva is, and technically his father is from uh, uh, Krishna, okay. Uh, India, Northern India, and uh, then he was born in the kingdom of Kucha, and uh, he traveled to China and did a lot of translation. Okay, that's Kumarajiba. He 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 is not Chinese in race. Okay, uh, Xuanzang, two hundred years later, is a Chinese monk. He his last name is Chen. Okay, he was born in China and become a monk. He just kind of like today's foreign student, he traveled all the way to India to become a scholar, uh, Buddhism scholar, and bring a lot of uh, sutra back to China and to the uh, 
uh, and work on the translation. So that's the two person are different and a lot of people constantly made mistake. So uh, that's I want to make it uh, clear here. So uh, right now, I think we can start and then uh, just one minute. So basically I have uh, six subjects to talk about. Okay, so basically first I will give a brief introduction about uh, Buddhism. Uh, because since uh, I haven't talked about Buddhism since this year, this year I haven't talked any about Buddhism. So uh, then I will talk about the uh, teaching of Mahayana Buddhism. Then I will give a brief introduction on the history background, uh, kingdom of Kucha, which on the, uh, is a metropolitan city or uh, a, a, a state uh, along the uh, Silk Road. Then I will intru introduce the person, uh, Kumarajiba. Then we will talk about Chinese Buddhism. Okay. And then we talk about the influence or importance of Chinese Buddhism, which were considered being uh, established by Kumarajiba. So that's today's subject. And then uh, I will pause for one minute if you have any question or any concern. No? Okay, so I will move on. Okay, let me introduce uh, Buddha, and most of people probably already, already know, but if you don't know, I, I just provide some uh, basic information. I'm not going to give a detailed information, but uh, if you are interested, and one day I will make up a special uh, uh, meetup uh, session to just talk, talk about Buddhism, philosophy, or religion. So just give a brief introduction about Buddha, the person. So basically, he was born, uh, I think he is 12 years older than Confucius. Okay. Confucius was born at 551 BC, and he was, I think he's 12 years old, if, if it's correct. And actually, he, technical, technical speaking, he is Nepali, okay, not India, the uh, uh, Lubini province in Nepal. And his family name is Guatama. That's a lot of people know. And he has a first name is Sitacha. And he doesn't have a birthday, okay? It's April 8th. If you are a Buddhist, uh, usually you will celebrate on the April 8th as the birth of Buddha. Uh, but it's based on the lunar calendar, not based on the Western uh, calendar. And the, Usually, Buddha is a common name we call, and which means uh, the united person, the, the one who united. And in the Buddhist sutra, many times he has been called with different titles. I didn't list all of them, but I just list the one important in uh, Chinese Buddhism. One is Tathagata, okay? and the very popular name is Ru Lai, a lot of people translate just direct. Tasagata is a Sanskrit name and it means thus comes one. Okay. So I think thus comes one is a good name okay, to translate from Ru Lai. Okay. So that's the very popular name in uh, Chinese uh, uh, writing. And another one is Bhagava or Bhagava, which means the blessed one. If you read the uh, Diamond Sutra, and usually they will call him uh, Bhagava. Okay. And another popular name is uh, Shakyamuni. And Shakyamuni means he is the sage of the Shakya clan because the kingdom, he, he was born as a prince. Uh, so the kingdom, the clan name is Shakya. So that's why sometimes he's called uh, Shakyamuni. So that's his name. And let's give a few uh, about his life. Okay. So I think it's interesting to compare him with Jesus. So if you look at, he was born at uh, 563 BC and he was born as a prince uh, uh, 
And I think after seven days, his first, his mother died. And then his uh, aunt, who is also his mother's younger sister, uh, taking care of him. So he was born in the royal family, unlike uh, Jesus was born uh, as a son of a carpenter and in the men. So that's the difference. Okay. So at the 35 years old and the Buddha uh, got united. Okay, the story is he, uh, he lived in a wonderful life, uh, comfortable life, but he, one day he went out, he realized, you know, a lot of people suffer. So he started to think about this kind of uh, situation, and a lot of questions he need to know, I need to answer. So he went out, become the ascetic monk, and, and then uh, at, when he was 35 years old, he sit under the Buddha tree and start to understand, okay, and he got united. Uh, and then he start to preach his teaching. Okay, so same as uh, Jesus, but his life was much longer, right? So same as Jesus, his teaching. And uh, when he reached 80 years old, he died, okay, and at the time, he already uh, very famous, and a lot of disciples surrounded, and he died peacefully. Unlike Jesus, he died at 33 years old, uh, got uh, crucified. But they have the same result. Um, uh, Jesus had the resurrection, and the uh, Buddha reached the Nirvara. Okay, basically, you get out of, of the same summer. The, you don't have to be reborn. That's the difference. So that's a brief life, a brief introduction of Jesus, uh, not Jesus, uh, Buddha's life, and which we call this religion, okay, uh, Buddhism, same as we call whoever believes Jesus as God, uh, we call uh, this religion Christian. Uh, before we introduce the uh, teaching of Buddhism, we need to give a brief understanding of uh, Hinduism, which Buddhism built on, just like Christians built on the uh, Judaism uh, tradition. So Hinduism tradition during that time, there's something uh, Buddha is not going to argue against, which is as a foundation, right? So something called Dharma, which is the method or if you talk, talk about in Taoism teaching is the Tao, okay? The way, okay, the Dharma. Okay. Asa means you have the meaning and you have the sense, you have the goal of your essence. Karma is you have a desire and which you also consider as the cause, okay? And the Moshe, liberation, you have to escape okay, from this. That's the basics of uh, Hinduism philosophy and probably that nobody going to deny this, same as Buddhism is not going to deny all this concept. And the samsara is another concept is also built in because people will get the reborn. Okay, so after you die and depend on how you are uh, did in this life and you will reborn in next life and then you will have uh, different life, okay. so again and again. So whatever you escape from the, uh, this central, you will reach Nirvara, or you are called uh, Moksha. So that's the basic understanding okay, during the Buddha's time, and probably uh, for all the Indian, uh, mm -hmm. Indian born religion, all have this, this one, including Hinduism, Jainism, uh, Sikh, and Buddhism all agree on this part. So there's no difference. Yeah. And the difference is start from here when Buddhism start to teach it, no matter which school and the Buddha himself as teaching is uh, Four Noble Truths, which is Dukkha, that's the truth of suffering. And uh, Samudaya, and that's the truth of the cause of suffering. Because 
and the niroda, which is the truth of the end of suffering, and the maga, which is the truth of the past. So that's the four noble truths. All the Buddhism uh, are not going to deny, no matter which school, that's the foundation. And you can look at is they all view this, uh, this world, uh, this life is suffering. And suffering doesn't mean you really painful, it means you are never satisfied. Okay, you eat and then you have to eat again, you will be hungry. Same as sex, after sex, then you're never satisfied. You want to do it again and again. So that's called suffering. And the, the cause of suffering is the dharma, uh, the, uh, the karma you have. So we talk about the cause and then you want to reach uh, the final goal, okay, and in the Buddhism teachings, in Yavara, okay, you want to get out of this cycle, and they have the way to reach it, so you can look at the answer of uh, what is today's life, where is the life coming, uh, the suffering coming from, and how do we end this, uh, 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 where is the, this life going to, and how do we take care of this life, so it covers with eight, uh, a noble, a noble, eight, a noble eightfold path, okay? right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, uh, right concentration, right mindfulness. And each one have the detail uh, instruction how to do it and each one have a detail. It depends on which school and how are you going to focus on that uh, a lot, a lot to talk about. So that's just the basic Buddhism teaching. And then um, uh, doesn't matter which school. And in today, we can roughly talk about Buddhism uh, as a three major school. Um, some, some people will say, oh, they have the more. And some people will say, but, but you know, let's make it clear. Okay, uh, we make it roughly three major school. One is uh, Theravada. Okay. And sometimes called uh, Hinaveda, uh, Hina, uh, Hinayama, Himayana. Okay, that means little vehicle. But I think the proper name should be uh, Seraveda, which means the teaching of the elder, and is uh, or you want to call it the Southern Buddhism, mainly dominates uh, in Sri Lanka and the Southeast Asia. And the, the tradition generally focus on study of the main text. And if you read. The, uh, uh, the text basically is party, party text. Party is an old uh, Hindu, Hindu uh, language, which I don't think anybody uses this language today. And uh, uh, another one, that's the one we will ho focus is Mahayana, which means great vehicle. Uh, basically, we can call it East Asian Buddhism, Eastern Buddhism, and basics it can uh, the major teach is only exist in Chinese, okay, because uh, uh, Kumarajiba. So you derive from the Chinese Buddhism tradition, which goes developed during the Han, start from Han dynasty and going up. And this tradition focuses on the teaching found in Mahayana Sutra, which are not considered uh, as uh, canonical or authoritative in Theravada and preserve in the, majorly preserve in the Chinese Buddhist uh, canon and in the classical Chinese language. So I doubt it today, sometimes you have a Mahayana text, which is in Sanskrit. And I believe, you know, it could be tr translated from Chinese back to Sanskrit, uh, to Sanskrit because the original Sanskrit probably lost. Okay, so the uh, uh, the, the 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 teaching has been preserved in the uh, classical uh, Chinese language, and there are many school. And at in the Mahayana Buddhism also have many schools and the different tradition with different texts and different focus. So, for example, the Zen Buddhism uh, we're going to talk about next week and the pure land okay, or uh, flower garden, which is uh, focused on the uh, Lotus Sutra. Okay. They all uh, 
belong to the Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, also include the one popular in Japan called uh, Nichiren, right? Also uh, uh, belong to Mahayana. And another one is um, so-called the uh, uh, Vashra vehicle or Vashrayana. Okay, it's uh, it's or sometimes people call it the mantra, mantra yana, uh, tantric Buddhism or historic uh, basics is Tibetan. Okay, so you can call Indo-Tibetan uh, Buddhism, and the, which developed a certain from Eastern Asian Buddhism. If some people consider uh, this school is part of uh, Mahayana, and, but I think their tradition is different. So, you know, probably give a different name. So that's the uh, uh, three major school we can talk about uh, on the Buddhism. So uh, before we move on, and that's have some, so Jian, do you have a question? Yeah, the question I have is, uh, I've heard about great vehicle and small vehicle. Yeah. Which one of these is the, uh, is the Theravada the small vehicle? Uh, Theravada is a small vehicle, okay. And okay. I kind of not going to use this name, and uh, then some scholars suggest that's the wrong name, because uh, when Mahayana create, uh, they call themselves big, great. So the other one is, of course, is small. So, uh, so it's not the name they will call themselves. They say that's the right. name people call it. And even in Xuanzang or in uh, uh, Feng Yulan's writing, I think he is still called Little Vehicle, and which I think we should change it you know, in today's environment, you know, just like you know, make it proper name. So uh, any other question? Uh, yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, I, yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, these three different schools, um, they're in, they in Chinese or are they also exist in India? Oh, okay. I, I, I would say it's international. Okay, okay. it's in, in international because uh, like in Thailand, Basically, it's a Theravada, and same as Sri Lanka. Okay, that's a Theravada. Okay, and the Mahayana is not only in China today. Japan, Korea, and Malaysia, or the East, uh, uh, East Asia, or uh, believe Mahayana Buddhism. Right, and then in in China, I guess in Chinese, we all call this uh, Fo Jiao Buddhism uh, as a general category for all three. Yes, yes, I think so. So that's why, you know, actually it's a lot of change, right? In Taiwan, I also realized a lot of uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist monk become popular in certain yeah. uh, trade, okay? Put this way, uh, uh, professional no. trade, okay? So because I, I don't know what's the reason, okay? But no. basics, they, so they mix together. Yeah, I mean, from for my, my little understanding that actually all of them study the same sutra, right? It's just that the practice or the way they meditate or the way they learn is a little bit different. The sutra is different, okay? So the sutra is different. Okay. Sutra is different. For, for example, okay, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, they have their own tradition and they study their own uh, Sutra. Okay. Sutra, okay. And the same as uh, Theravada, they have their own Pali uh, canon text. Okay, the, the text is written in, in Pali, Pali them. And Pali and the Sanskrit is very close. Okay, that's why sometimes you will see that uh, spelling is uh, slightly different. Usually Pali have an N at the end and Sanskrit doesn't have an N at the end. But, yeah, but I think, I think all of them still share like the major sutras, one of the major ones, like the Diamond Sutra, the Half Sutra, I think um, they do still, there, there's some commonality to some of the sutras that they study, and then there are others that they divert. Okay. Yes, yeah. So that's why I put this one, the, uh, the basics of Buddhism teaching, they are all the same. I believe in the Tibetan, they also believe the same thing. But just like uh, Christian, right, when you, 
branch out and the, uh, they have the new text coming out and the old tradition will not recognize the new tradition. For example, uh, Jews were, Jew, uh, uh, Jewish uh, religion will not recognize new Testament, but the uh, Christian religion will recognize the uh, Old Testament, this kind of situation. Oh, just one last quick question. The, the Zen school Buddhism, actually, it's kind of a little bit of a gray area with the tantric, with the Tibetan Buddhism. Is, is, there, is there an overlap there? I, I don't think they have an overlap. I, think, I, I don't think they have an overlap. They're probably exclusive. Okay. So uh, there's a story is when the uh, mm -hmm. Tibet, Tibet is decide to have a religion, a Buddhism religion. They invite uh, both Indian monk and uh, a Chinese monk who represent Zen Buddhism okay, to have a debate. And then they can decide which side they will go. Okay? And of course, you can see if you debate from, <laughs> from Zen, right? Zen is silence, so <laughs> for sure they are going to lose. So. Uh, so that's why right. they went their way. So right. uh, that's the story. Uh, we have a few hands up. Let's go. Just one minute. Okay. We have. Uh, is that Phil? Phil. Please. Yes. Uh, you know, generally we think of Southeast Asia as Theravada, but what is Vietnam? I mean, what does it practice? I, I believe Vietnam is, uh, is Mahayana. Okay? That's what I think so, yeah. Yeah, and that's one book I always want to introduce, okay, uh, uh, Tina Han, okay. He passed, he passed away, uh, I don't know who he, uh, heard about uh, Tina Han. Tina Han is a very famous, uh, second most influential uh, yeah. Buddhist monk. Uh, in he Tibet. passed away earlier this year. Yeah, January. Because at that time, I was thinking about have a section talk about him. But since I'm follow the uh, Feng Yu Lan I think okay, let's wait to the proper time. So I still debate whether or not I should introduce uh, him. And uh, this book, the heart of the Buddha teaching. Uh, I think this book is very good for as an introduction. Uh, so I'm thinking about whether or not I should include this one or to introduce Tina Han. Uh, so uh, he. And he's Vietnamese. And I read it, this book, and I find out he has a long, even he being considered as a Zen Buddhist and which belong to Mahayana. But I can see because his uh, ge geographic location in Vietnam. So I do see a lot of uh, Theravada flavor, but that's just my personal feeling. And uh, some people will say, no, 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 you miss any. So that, that's just, just me, you know. I feel, I feel uh, he has a lot of uh, 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 uh flavor in his teaching. So that's just me. Uh, James, please. I just had to mention, yeah. The, I just had to mention that the, uh, the 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 Tibetan Buddhists are so famous for their art and uh, sound. Uh, their 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 sounds. They have all kinds of bells. Uh, actual tools like uh you know uh machines that make that make sound uh and the uh, and the meditation by the by the monks combined monks oh you know um uh, in a very low tone uh, so um i think they also have a martial arts form I'm not sure if that's the uh, them them also. It might be that that might be only in uh, China. I I don't think so, but I, I could be wrong. But uh, one thing to un, to one good movie is that's a very old movie called uh, Seven Years in Tibet by uh, Brad Pitt. Okay, and that's a good movie. Okay, so it talks yeah. about the uh, young Dalai Lama. So I think that's a great movie. Yeah. I'm from I'm from Los Angeles, and people went nuts when that. When that came out, people just went nuts, and everybody was going to Tibet and showing off their toys that they bought there and stuff. It was it was great. Okay, so Tibet is a, a little bit difficult, and then I hope one day I can find somebody to have a proper introdu introdu uh, introduction on, on this subject. Okay. So, Apin, please. 
A quick question. Um, so I thought, according to legend at least, Zen Buddhism was introduced by the Indian monk Dhamma to yeah. China, right? So, so uh, I, I, at least if you believe the legend, then Zen Buddhism really started in India and came to China. Okay, I hope I can convince you today. Okay, that's that's, that's wrong. Okay, so <laughs> sure, sure. Chinese, are, Chinese also you, you probably, we probably know right. Chinese also very good to, to favorite story, right? So <laughs> so so after you have the great uh, uh, philosophy or, or teacher, right? Then you don't say I created. They say you know, uh, two thousand years ago somebody make this one, and then that's the name. They give you all twenty seven names. So I hope I can convince you today. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's move on. Okay, for uh, next subject, we're going to give a quick introduction of Mahayana Buddhism. So when we talk about Mahayana Buddhism, and since there's oh, another big question, okay, that's debatable okay, in the scholarly debate. Uh, how does, how does, uh, Buddhism religion disappeared in India, right? It, there's a period of time around this time, about the first, the second, uh, second, third century. Buddhist is the most popular philosophy religion in India, but basically it's all gone. Okay? And then the, especially Mahayana Buddhist, Buddhism, you have to go to China, read the classical Chinese text, which mostly translated by um, Kumarajiva. So what, why is this appear? That's a big question and it's constantly debate. So before we go to the, uh, uh, the uh, Mahayana Buddhism, the person is important is uh, Nagarjuna. Okay? Nagarjuna in Chinese is called Longsu, okay? Longsu Pusa. Okay? So he is, a, in, uh, I, I, I don't know if uh, he is, a, monk or not, but basically he's a great philosopher and a lot of uh, study about him. So some make, and his teaching become the key of uh, Mahayana Buddhism. So first, the concept of uh, sunyata, okay, emptiness, which is not being focused in the uh, Theravada, but it's in the Mahayana, is sunyata, okay, the emptiness. And another thing, uh, Fong Yolan's uh, the writing, he introduced on this one. So I just summarized in, the, in uh, as, uh, uh, Nakajura's uh, teaching, his philosophy. So he talked about two truths, which is uh, relative truth and absolute truth. So relative truth is the uh, truth in common sense, okay, for, com uh, for everybody to understand. And absolute truth is the for the higher sense, I put this way. Okay. And he talked about the causality, which is being translated uh, in, uh, uh, as yuan in Chinese, and then uh, the proper word. The causality is not like uh, Aristotelian's A uh, cause B as a four causes, this kind of cause. Basically, is talking about dependent origination. So basically he's talking about when A exists, B will exist. If A ceases to exist, B will cease, ceases to exist. This kind of phenomenon. So it's a little bit different, but that's what he's talking about. Then he also talking about the uh, relativity. So he talked about the big, the small, there's no absolute, right? Uh, as a big, as small. I think this is uh, easy to understand. Another thing we call him a uh, skepticism, okay? Because he is talking about the tetralemma, okay? not that uh, dilemma, he talk about tetralemma. Okay, he talk about the situation could have four, four different situations. A can be true, or A can be false, or both A and not A, about A, uh, A can be both true and false, or A can be neither true nor false. So this 
teacher leads to he talk about the emptiness. And also we call it the middle way. That's the, um, uh, the, the, the result he's talking about. And the middle way is important, okay. Uh, even in the early Buddha teacher, uh, the uh, Shakyamuni, okay, uh, Gautama Buddha, he also teach middle way. But Mahayana's middle way is so-called uh, uh, is so-called uh, uh, Madhyamaka, okay, which is being taught by uh, Nagarjuna and translated by uh, uh, Kumarajiva. So uh, we have uh, Joe had the hands up. Uh, yeah, um, going back to the uh, so does this essentially what you're talking about something the equivalent of the law of excluded middle where something is neither true or false. Yeah, yes, but he, if in this way, he is rejects exclusive middle, right? In this way, he is rejects exclusive middle because there's no exclusive middle. It could be true, could be false, could be both true and false, could be neither true nor false. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Actually, okay. we can find the equivalent Western philosophy here. I'm going to introduce quickly. Okay. An Anaxagoras. Yeah. Anaxagoras believed uh, that. Uh, okay. That. We, we, we can talk about this one. Yeah. Okay. It's in, uh, uh, it's in a book by uh, 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 Aristotle. Um, oh, really? Okay. That's great. Yeah. So uh, let's back to Buddha's teaching, original teaching. Uh, Buddha's teaching about the middle way basically talk about the between two things, okay? So you don't self-deny because at that time, the Hindu, uh, Hinduism, a state, ascetic monk basically doing a lot of self-denying and the, the royal family a lot of self-indulgence. So he kind of tried to avoid the two extremes. And then the view of reality, he also avoids the eternalism and annihilationism. Okay, so he tried to avoid two um, extremes. And then um, uh, he also reject or resist to uh, unconditional accept of any extreme way of practical uh, practice, uh, practical and the theoretical viewpoint. So he is kind of like stay in the middle, all okay? right? That's Buddha's, original Buddha's teaching in the middle way, more on the, uh, the way of living. And uh, uh, Nagarjuna, okay, he's teaching about the Mediamaka, okay? Which also translate as middle path or middle way, okay? Uh, in Chinese, we we'll call Zhongguan, okay? observation. And he's talking about without relying on convention, the ultimate fruit is not taught. So you have to rely on convention and also rely on the ultimate, which is he's talking about nirvana. So without understanding the ultimate, which is nirvana, nirvana will not attain. He's talking about the character is neither existent no non-existent, no both existent and uh, non-existent, no neither. And uh, the centralist should be the true reality. And uh, you want to be free from this four possibility, which is tetralemma, uh, 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 tetralemma, okay. So, with the, uh, the cessation of ignorance, which is talk about 12 uh, link uh, of the dependent, codependent origination. So the formation can cease arise. So that's his religious teaching. Basics, you want to reach um, uh, Nirvana, you have to stop, cease the cessation of ignorance because everything starts from ignorance. So this kind of teaching, were being translated by Kumarajiva and right written in the Chinese, uh, classical Chinese writing. And that's become today's uh, canon or 
uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, Pim, please. So just trying to uh, better understand the middle way. So growing up, I will hear about these famous monks that practice, I would say extreme self-denial and led very, very parsimonious lives. <laughs> and I was told that it's because human existence is really at the cost of other lives. Even if you're vegetarian, you're, you're killing plants yeah. to uh, sustain yourself. So is that, I think Hong Yi Fa Shi was um, a famous example. So is that against the middle way or is that a different concept that I they're think, not at odds? Uh, okay, I think it depends on where we stand for, right? We are living in today's luxury life and we will see them as ascetic monk, right? Even all the monks are ascetic. But if we look at, at the uh, uh, Buddha, uh, Guatemala's time, right? I talk about the, uh, uh, 2,500 years ago. And the, uh, the, I think if we know, uh, I think the Jainism, right? The Jainism practice even consider the uh, plant as life, a rock as a feeling. So you have to be very careful. So they, their uh, priests would be very, very much self-denial. And they, so if you look at the uh, Buddha himself, when he tried to meditation, he has been like seven days, not eating, not drinking, almost died. Okay. That's kind of extreme he's talking about. And until he got united under the Buddha tree, so he start to eat. I think a, 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 a lady bring a girl bring the milk to him, and he realized, you know, he should not go to extreme. So in today, we like me, a meat eater, and you see vegetarian as ascetic, but you know, for Buddha, he probably uh, it's his middle way. So, <laughs> Th thank you, <laughs> uh, Alex, please. Yeah, I. I actually never heard of this middle way. Do you know the translation in Chinese, the term oh. middle way? Zhong guan, zhong guan. Zhong guan. Guan means observation. Right. Okay, that's and then, all. Right. And then um, also uh, reading some of the sutras, right? Um, my understanding also is that a lot of times it's it's a form of, of writing where they say, okay, you see this this is what it is. And then it says, no, but it's really not what it is. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a backward negation way of philosophy that um, you, you think you see something, you think you're doing this, you think you see Buddha, uh, you think you might have done some, but actually it's all, it's in your mind and it's not really there. And when you say, okay, then if it's not really there, then what it is? And, and the answer is um, something else negate, to negate it. So it's a, it's a, it's a philosophy that is um, very, for me, very kind of um, uh, like, uh, 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 like, you know, it, you, it, you, you present a, an issue, a problem. I wouldn't say problem, but then, right straight away you being you being you know refuted like no what you're thinking is actually not what you what you think you know it's, yes. it's I, and I, and i've never i mean if i compare to western philosophy you know this is a very special type of way of you know uh right just in terms of writing in terms of you know explaining philosophy you know yeah, I think the, the way of uh, explaining is very Chinese. Well, I don't know if it's a Chinese style or Indian style, but basics, uh, I, I will introduce some uh, uh, today, uh, some text basics in this way. It's a lot of negation of negation of negation. So that's it. And then uh, just back to the Western philosophy, I do uh, think uh, uh, James talk about Annex Lagres, but I'm thinking about this philosopher, okay, uh, uh, Sextus in Paris, okay, and almost around the same time as Nagarajiva, okay, the same, the, the Nagarjuna, okay, the same time as Nagarjuna, okay, and the both, and then 
he talked about the suspension of judgment. Okay, so I think that's a very good book uh, he talked about. And I don't see other Western philosophy, uh, philosopher had talking about this. He talked about, uh, I, I hope I'm not biased or misread, but when I read this book, I find out it's very much like Nagarjuna's uh, middle way, okay? Or mid, um, the middle way, okay? Because he's talking about, he tried to, some, something you may see is ridiculous. He's trying to prove, okay, uh, three is not, three times three is not equal to six, something like this. Uh, and he tried to prove everything could be wrong. And his conclusion is you should see the attitude of your life or to see everything should be suspension of judgment. And then the scholar believe, you know, because uh, Sextus in Paris, he studied the uh, Philo, the person, uh, Philo, uh, Piro. Piro is the person uh, live around uh, 300 BC who traveled with Alexander the Great and he settled, he, he visited India and then come back in the uh, Greek. And that's why he bring this kind of philosophy back to Greek and to the Roman time. Sextus Imperatus, uh, he is a physician and he write this book. That's why I feel like, you know, we can find the equivalent in uh, Western tradition. Uh, wrong, please. Yes, so uh, Jason, um, in hearing this, uh, I'm kind of like uh, really appreciating um, uh, when you have a paradox, it's like a dilemma. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, how can it be and not be? That's a dilemma. And so like die means two. So there's two. Now, all of a sudden, I've heard for the first time, instead of a dilemma, you have a, a tetralemma, four. Yeah. In other words, not only is it, it's true and it's not true, but it's also, it's true and not true, and it's neither true and not true. So um, what I'm getting from this and where I, I, I could see where it leads to uh, Zen and, 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 and fits in so nicely with Taoism is the message is, if you think you know something, if you think you've pinned it down, if you think you understand it, uh, you're totally wrong. That's it's, right. <laughs> it, it's way, way more, you know, and that uh, the message is that the mind, the intellect, the brain that we use to try to understand everything is just inadequate to deal with tetralemmas. Yeah, thank you, Ram. Okay. So let's move on uh, for the uh, 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 Mahayana Buddhism, okay? Besides the philosophical part, they have a religious part. Uh, Bodhisattva, uh, okay? That's a new being being introduced in the Mahayana Buddhism. And Nagarjuna has been viewed as one of the uh, Bodhisattva, okay? So Bodhisattva doesn't exist in the, uh, 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 Theravada Buddhism, uh, okay, and but in the uh, 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 Tibetan Buddhism, they have the uh, Bodhisattva. Okay. So in Mahayana Buddhism, a Bodhisattva refers to anyone, any being who has generated Bodhisattva, which means Bodhi. Bodhi means uh, enlightenment or wisdom. Uh, Sicha means consciousness. Okay, a spontaneous with the compassionate mind. Compassionate is important, okay, to attain uh, Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay, so that's the key. That's why I call it the Mahayana, means great vehicle, because they are not doing for yourself. They are doing for all the benefit of all sentient beings. Not all people, Okay, all races, people also include all the animals. So that's what he's talking about. And that's why Mahayana Buddhism like to call the Theravada as little vehicle because they only take care of a small group of people. They are uh, Mahayana taking care of all the people. So very much like the Jesus revolution. He's not talking about himself. He's talking about savior, save all the people. 
everybody, not just Jews. So that's the kind of uh, revolution. And the Bodhisattva, original Theravada or Buddha teacher, Buddha never claimed he is God or he's spiritual or something. No, he just talked about, he just jumped out the, uh, uh, the, the, the samsara. So Buddhist, Bodhisattva become a kind of the God in today's point of view, okay? especially being borrowed from religious Taoism. Uh, so Bodhisattva, uh, Bodhisattva, uh, Bodhisattva totally become God-like beings. And important thing, they have the full immeasurable mind. Okay, so uh, in, uh, that's all uh, 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 Kumar Rajiva's uh, uh, translation. Okay, so called love, kindly, uh, love, kindness, okay, and compassion, uh, empathic, and uh, equanimity. Okay, so that's the Buddha heart. And the important thing, they have the, if you read the uh, Lotus Sutra, that's the one introduced a lot of. Uh, Bodhisattva. Okay. So there's many, many, nobody know how many uh, Bodhisattva have. Okay. But I just want to uh, introduce uh, five important and uh, the one is uh, Manchuri, Manchuri uh, uh, Bodhisattva. Okay. That's uh, Bodhisattva of wisdom. Okay. So he write on the uh, things that I, okay. and uh, then another one is uh, Sitikaba. Okay. Sitikaba is the Earth uh, source and being viewed as the uh, Bodhisattva in charge of the hell, okay, like Haiti. Okay. So this one you're probably familiar with. You go to a Chinese restaurant, okay, Maitreya, okay, the friendly Buddha. Okay, so basis in charge of the future world, the, uh, the the future world, the Buddha of the future world, and the, the uh, uh, same. Semantapatra, okay, which is the universal word, all good, okay, the high virtue of the Buddha. Okay. And uh, this one is the most popular in, uh, in the uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Dalai Lama is the reincarnation of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. Uh, Bodhisattva okay. So uh, popular the name in uh, Chinese is Guan Yin. And a lot of uh, English translation just direct translate as Guan Yin. Okay, so that's, uh, but the original name is uh, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. Okay. So uh, they had the Guan Yin or Guan Si Yin, they had a story between disagreement, uh, Xuanzang disagree uh, what uh, 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 Kumar Rajiba's translation, uh, uh, his name. So that's the popular. Uh, uh, Bodhis, uh, Bodhisattva, okay, uh, Mahayana Buddhism. So that's, I think that's it for the, uh, yes. Okay, Pin, please. So um, I, uh, again, I, I'm not sure if I just um, confused about others. So I think, <clears throat> When I was young, I heard stories that the uh, Di Zhang Wang uh -huh. and Guan Shiyin, they were actually ordinary human beings, right? And then achieved nirvana to become Buddha Sava. Is that is that how yes. is that how it works? That you start as a human and you can become a Buddha Sava. And also I is going up, you know, listening to the stories, I I I had the impression that. Uh, these two were actually Chinese, at least these two were actually Chinese uh, <laughs> when they were ordinary humans, but I, I guess I'm wrong uh, uh, now listening to your lecture that they were, they were actually not Chinese when they were mundane humans, uh, they were. I don't think they are Chinese, they are Indian, okay. Okay. Uh, Avaloki Tishwara uh, introduced by uh, 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 Kumar Rajiva and then when Xuanzang visited India, and he visit, I think his account of uh, record of Western, not the book Journey to the West. I think Xuanzang's writing. He talk about the place he visit, okay, the statue of uh, Avalokiteshvara, and Xuanzang totally disagree on the translation Guan Yin Pusa because he said, how can you observe 
the sun. Okay, it's wrong. So if you read the uh, Heart Sutra translated by Xuan Zhang, he called it Guan Zi Zai Pusa. He he means Aviloki Tishvara doesn't mean observe the sun. So this means free free mind. Okay, that's mm. his debate. So I try to ask people who know Sanskrit to explain, but I don't know. Nobody give me a right answer, uh, satisfied answer. So that's the only thing I know. So I probably sure. And all this, uh, all this drama has been written in the uh, Lotus Sutta, which was translated by uh, Kumarajiva. So I don't think Kumarajiva invented this uh, uh, Bodhisattva. I believe he translated from Sanskrit. So yeah. And then again, we probably have a lot of, for example, uh, Guan Yin, right? Uh, Avadoki Tishwara was a man. And then right now you probably see us as a woman, right? So that's a totally being changed and they all become Chinese back. So. Yeah, thank you very much for clearing up my, uh, all of my confusions, yeah, <laughs> appreciate it. It's it just like when you read the uh, Greek uh, Greek mythology, right? A lot of things doesn't make, make sense, right? Because sometimes how come his father and then become daughter? How come he has two different kinds of uh, background? So, you know, so same thing. Uh, Phil, please. Yeah, uh, this is a confusing issue <laughs> for me because Bodhisattva are beings that achieve Buddhahood, uh, but they uh didn't go to nirvana at they least yet they at come least back as yet you and me okay they come back but, to you and me but they but they they remain uh in, in order to help people yes they're compassionate yeah because they, they yeah. are not going to stay in nirvana until everybody is yeah. safe so on one set on one way of thinking is is they they are a kind of a spirit in a way, you know, if you could call that a God, okay. But a spirit. Uh, so on the one hand, they seem to be higher than Buddha because Buddha was just interested in attaining Buddhahood, right? Uh, well, these, uh, these guys have achieved good Buddhahood, but they had a greater uh, compassion for all of humanity. And so, if so, and one on the one hand they are in some sense higher than Buddha, but on the other hand, they are not higher than Buddha because Buddha is the, is the religion. Okay, so it, it's kind of confusing. It's a little bit like Jesus and the compassion and dying on the cross for us. Okay, mm -hmm. for humanity. In one sense, you could say he's higher in the sense of compassionately becoming a human and then and then uh, a dying for humanity. But on the other hand, you know, you always have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You, you do not say the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, like, so this is a, a little bit confusing about exactly what, what the hierarchy sequencing is, because on the one hand, it seems like they are higher, but on the other hand, they are are absolutely also not higher, so. Yeah, I think that's the same confusion. If you feel it's a confusion and then um, Trinity could be the same kind of situation. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I think that uh, let's put on this one because I'm, we will have a more chance to discuss more detail on the religion or on the Buddhism in general. Okay, and then, so we have another hand up. Uh, Yes, please. Yeah, I, well, to me, it just seems to boil down to the uh, claim by Buddha that he was not a god. Most most Buddhists don't believe that Buddha is a god. So the the idea that bodhisattvas have such a status doesn't like exclude uh, Buddha's mortality. Yeah. So to uh, me, is it today I being viewed as god. Oh, remember, all these are Mahayana Buddhism. But you will see them in the um, uh, religious Taoism temple, okay? especially Guan Yin. Okay? So basically it's kind of a mix. So probably the true uh, Buddhists will not view them as God, but the 
religious Taoist will see them as God. So, yeah. yeah well, it, it boils it, down to the tetralemma. Pin, yes. Well, if you're Buddhist, there should be no hierarchy, right? So it's, it's well, not relevant. You, I think one day we will talk about the, the, the journey to the West, the novel. Okay, so that's also interesting part. You know, they have the ranking, okay, just bureaucratic ranking because. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Before we introduce uh, the Kumar Rajiva, then introduce the, uh, I think that's the part that a lot of people ask, you know, about the Silk Road. So let's talk about Silk Road a little bit. And during this time, the period of time here, let's remember it's about 350 BC. Okay, that's uh, that, uh, 350 CE, the century. Okay, so the Chinese, take, uh, uh, okay, let, let's do the uh, Silk Road here. So here's China, okay, from, what's the place? Xi'an, Nanjing, so anyway, but that's China and the, is a road to Xi, uh, Xi'an, okay. I think that's a Xi'an and then that's the Silk Road all the way to, but during this time, since the, uh, since the um, Islamic religion hasn't started yet. So I don't think here has the connection. So basics, the major cultural, uh, so-called the Western world in Chinese is India and the Indian culture spread around in this area. So they all Indian like culture and they are Buddhism, okay? So this uh, city or state, it's called Kucha. In Chinese they call Chu Ci, Gui Zi. I don't know what's the proper pronunciation, but the, uh, should be called Kucha. That's the powerful state. So you look at the map, Okay, kingdom of Kucha. Uh, it's a kingdom from the first century to the seventh century when the Tang Dynasty uh, arrived, then Tang Dynasty destroyed this uh, state. And it's in the base uh, Xinjiang, China. Okay, so it's on the, this side is, uh, uh, so when we call, talk about the Wei War, uh, that's the area we are talking about on the west border of China in today. And during that time, it's an ancient Buddhist kingdom okay, located in the north branch of the Silk Road. Look at, uh, if you think Silk Road, and at that time, Silk Road basis communicated with India, Northern India. So there's a two route, here is, is the desert. Okay, So the road go north and the south. So the north road, north route is Kucha. Okay? So it's a major city. Uh, major state and Kucha is a Central Asian metropolis and was the most populous oasis in the towering uh, basin. Okay. So Kucha became very powerful and rich in the last quarter of the fourth century uh, and about to take over most of the trade along the Silk Road because the, in the, the trade going there and if you occupy the nice place, you can tax them and then you can become a very rich. So if you look at the little bit political, okay, if you recall, okay, uh, for last three sessions, we talk about Taoism, right? And then the political situation is, if you review, we have the warrior state, then we have a Han dynasty for 400 years, then China become break up, okay, for about 400 years. And the last two, six, three, a few sections, we talk about the Jin, we talk about Neo Taoism, we talk about religious Taoism, which is on the southern part. At that time, China is many countries. So uh, in the northern part, they also have many countries uh, uh, run by uh, 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 some tribe, uh, five different uh, um, uh, tribe. Let me try to the five tribe name, okay. Uh, run by the tribe, right? And during that time, about 350 CE, the major dominant uh, state is called former Qin. And if you recall, we talk about the uh, Neo Taoism, Xuan Xue. Uh, they have the famous battle of uh, Fei River. That's the Qian Qin. He was big, he, uh, the Fu Jian is the emperor. He uh, 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 unite all the tribe 
and built a powerful northern dynasty. And that's the time he claimed he has a million troops want to cross the Yangtze River to annex okay, the Eastern Jin. And the Prime Minister Xie Xuan, okay, uh, we talk about this in the, when we talk about the Seven Sage and the Bamboo uh, Group, he is the person who strategy or by luck, for whatever reason, uh, defeated uh, Fu Jian. So uh, the China split for the uh, uh, Eastern Jin and the South and uh, uh, Qin, we call it the Qian Qin, which will be try to uh, separate from the Qin Dynasty on the 200 BC. Okay. So this one we call Qian Qin. So these two, uh, 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 China has been split in North and the South, and the, their culture are also different. In the South, the dominant philosophy is neo Taoism, And the, in the Northern part, the major philosophy is Buddhism. So that's why you know, we separate, become the two sections. We talk about neo Taoism okay, for the South Southern part and the Buddhism on the Northern part. So, so here is the become a, a state uh, dominated by Buddhism. And the Fu Jian, the emperor, he also promote Buddhism. So that's why he is interested in Buddhism. So let's talk about Kucha. Okay, that's the writing from Xuanzang when he that is a uh, two hundred years at two three hundred years at this time. So he, that's his, his description about the kingdom of Kucha. You can imagine what kind of uh, uh, state. He said the soil is suitable for rice and the grain. It's all in oasis. It produces great uh, pomegranate, uh, pom pomegranates and the numerous species of plum, pears, peach, and almonds. Sounds like a color, the way the public sounds like California. The ground is rich and minor gold, copper, iron and the dead and the tin. The air is soft. The manner of the people honest. The style of writing is Indian okay. with some differences. They excel other country in their skill in playing on the lute and the pipe. So this country also famous for their dancing and the music. And there a lot of Chinese uh, music artists uh, imported from uh, Kucha. They clothe themselves with ornament garment of silk and embroidery. There are about 100 garment in the country with 5,000 more discipline. It's a Buddhism uh, state. Unlike today, it's an Islamic uh, religion. But today, uh, during that time, basically it's Buddhism. Okay. This belongs to the little vehicle. That's uh, Xuanzang's writing. And that's why I call it, I, think I put it as a, uh, of school. I don't know what that means, but basically that's one school of Siddhaveda. Their doctrine and their rule of discipline are like those of India. They are those who read them, use the same origin. So basically their language is a Sanskrit type of language, about 40 li, 40 miles. So there, there are two um, outside the Western Gate, there's the chief city and the right left. Okay, they have the uh, the great uh, figure of Buddha, about 90 feet high, it's a very high Buddha statue. And I think today, before the Taliban destroyed, and I think uh, you probably still can see the, uh, the statue of Buddha. So that's about the, uh, the state uh, of uh, Kucha. Uh, Phil, please. Yeah, could I ask a question? This, this is more, it's more of a racial question in this sense. Right now, when I look at uh, Xinjiang, the people do not look Asian or what you call mongoloi, you know? And, and, but back in that time, doing the, uh, the Silk Road thing, when we're talking about, I'd always imagined before this that they were sort of like Mongolian-like. Uh, what was the racial makeup at that time like? Uh, are they like, because, because right, right now, now in Xinjiang, it doesn't look anything like, like uh, you know, like Chinese people at all. Uh, even the Tibetans look kind of Chinese. They're not, but they, they look uh, Asian in that sense. 
So could you could you explain or do you know I, what the I, population I, was like? I, I'm not expert on that, but I I kind of uh, interested in this part. So what, that's what I believe. Okay. So I believe this time during this area they are Indian. Okay. They are okay. Indian culture. Okay. And this yellow area they are Turk. Okay. They're Turk. Okay. So uh, we will talk about the Tang Dynasty uh, uh, later. Your know, Tang Dynasty basis they their blood is Tur Turkish blood. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the Chinese general, they for generation because they try to prevent the Turk invention. So the best way is marry their daughter. Okay, so they got the mix and mix with the Turk. So that's the racial issue. And here, basics they are Indian because uh, if you look at the, the painting or the drawing during that time, they draw people. If the people was dark. Okay, that's India. Okay, so uh, Kumarajiva is dark. Okay, so it's India. Okay, and today you probably look like the say the sun have the blue eye, green eye, you know. Look and the, the no, I believe that's what I believe because later on for the Persian and on the east they come to this side. Okay, okay. so they have the more Western like mixed together. So that's just my, my, my imagination or my best guess. Um, can I just add a little bit quickly yeah, okay, of, of that region during that time? During yeah. the time of Kuramajiva, okay, uh, that is a country of mainly Buddhism and the surrounding countries, you know, they have, they all have different dialect or what you call different language back then. And he um, was very uh, smart. He was able to learn many languages around that area. So. Um, even though maybe that the ethnicity would be similar, but the languages, they all have independent languages and maybe have their own independent culture, however short they were, even though in the end, they were all conquered by the Chinese, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I also would like to add, um, even today, there is a great mixture of ethnicities in Xinjiang, uh, many of them, will look what you would say uh, East Asian. Some of them are more of the sub Indian um, subcontinent. So there's a great mixture. It just happens so that in the US, the images that we see tend to, you see more of, more of the more Caucasian um, uh, ethnicities. And uh, so that's been true throughout history in, in Xinjiang. And also, just to point out that the Turkic, Turkic people, they actually originated in the Xinjiang mm -hmm. area, uh, including those that eventually wound up in modern day Turkey. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Pim. Uh, CK, please. Yeah, I was going to ask another question, but I, I would like to sort of speak on what was just discussed. I think the, the original Turks uh, were Mongoloids. Yeah, they were yeah. not uh, Caucasian mixed because later on they became what they look like today due to the gradual absorption and conquest and integration of the uh, peoples that they have conquered, especially during the Ottoman Sultanate mm -hmm. uh, era. Uh, but previously they were uh, more Mongoloid looking, I believe. Yeah, sure. Yes, and for Xinjiang, uh, I'm not really sh sure that it's, uh, I mean, the facial features, because it, what, right, what you're saying, uh, Jason, if they are dark skin, they must be Indian. Well, Indians, the dark skin Indians were down to the south, you know, they were the uh, Dravidians. Oh no! I, I heard the, uh, the 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 they describe the uh, the picture. They they just compare. They they just try to distinct. Right? I think they do it dark. They try to distinct from non Chinese and non Chinese. Yeah. Right, but, but the, the the Indians that are really in ruling uh, so called India at the time were they were fair skinned They were Aryan looking people, I believe. Like, oh yeah, the... uh, that could be. That could be probably the. The Aryan at that time, Indian probably Aryan 
Uh, yeah, that's why they invented the so-called caste system so that their rule can be legitimized and uh, concretized forever for eternity. So the Dravidians will be forever at the lower stratum of society. Um, <laughs> but that's not what that, that's not my question. I, I want to ask the uh, the description about uh, uh, Kucha by uh, Xuanzang. Can you go back there? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So when he said the style of writing is Indian, what is the actual word he used? Because I don't think India exists as a concept. Um, yeah, they say Fan Wen. Okay, so basics, uh, basically, I believe Xuanzang is a master in Sanskrit. And uh, then I believe uh, when we talk during this time, I, the, we don't know the race, what kind of race of people, but I believe Indian probably their major culture, right? Just like, you know, India never built a powerful empire like China. So, but their culture probably spread northward during that time. So what is the actual word he used for in for, for this English word Indian? I'm sure he didn't say Hindu, right? It must no, be no. some Kendru. Kendru. Kendru, okay. Kendru or Fan I think. I didn't I didn't read this one in Chinese. Okay. Right, right. So I guess, yeah, that that that's a bit of a an, an interesting um kind of translation confusion because India is really a, 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 a more like a Greek Greco Ro Re Roman concept. Yeah, I mean, they, they call they call Tianzhu. They all yes. call and Tianzhu doesn't cover all of India. I think it only covers part a part of India. Yeah, at that time they probably talk about northern part of India. Yes. Yeah. So that's uh yeah that's just the style of writing is probably Sanskrit is what you're saying, right? I believe it's the same. Yeah. During okay. that time, yeah. And then uh, Xuanzang is pretty good in Sanskrit. Yeah. Right. Then India is also in tra translated into Chinese sometimes as Shendu or Hindu, right? So that's, I think that's the later time. Yeah. Right. Okay. Time. Okay. That's my question, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. So let's move on to uh, uh, Kumarajiba, okay. the, the person. So story is, he's a major story, but we have to start from his father, okay? Kumar, Rajivama's father, Kumayana, okay? So his father, Kumayana, was a Kashmiri, okay? So he is the Northern uh, uh, Indian, okay? As a, belong to the very, the highest Bra uh, Brahmin caste. And he's the son of a high minister. And, uh, uh, just like uh, Buddha, uh, Gautama Buddha, uh, Kumarayana renounced his wealth and the social ranking and become famous Buddhist monk. And uh, Kumarayana left the uh, Kushmi and to keep to the missionary, just like Saint Paul, left the uh, um, spread the teaching of Buddhism to the country. He wanted to go to China to preach, okay, to spread the Buddhism teaching, and. Uh, of course, he had to follow the uh, Silk Road. And uh, then when he reached the king of Kucha, and uh, then um, the king respecting uh, Kumarayana's uh, eminence and the wish, and uh, wanted uh, him to discontinue his journey and uh, stay there, stay in Kucha to become the royal priest. Uh, so uh, Kumaraya, uh, Kumarayana that was forced okay, to marry the wisest woman in Kucha, who is the king's sister, uh, Jivaka. So it turned out Kumarayana hasn't had a chance uh, to go to China. So it turned out he has to stay and marry the princess and, uh, and have a son. And of course, the son is Kumarajiva. So according to the legend, when uh, Kumarayana uh, married uh, the Jivaka, when Jivaka was pregnant, she all of a sudden she can speak Sanskrit, okay, from nowhere, okay, she just speaks Sanskrit, okay, and become much much smart, like, it. and after uh, Kumarajiva was born, she cannot speak Sanskrit anymore, okay. so that shows the intelligence. Yeah, the 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 intelligence 
of uh, Kumar Rajiva. So uh, when he reached 20 years old, Kumar Rajiva became the famous Buddhist scholar and known for his broad learning and the skill in debate. He is good in debate. So uh, okay, we'll talk about this later. So uh, when he was 35 years old, remember Fu Jian is the emperor of the former Qin. Okay, he is powerful. He uh, he he promote Buddhism. So uh, he ordered his general Lu Guang. Okay, he said, "Send me Kumar Rajiva as soon as you conquer Kucha." So he sent his general to conquer Kucha in order to get uh, Kumar Rajiva. That's how famous of uh, Kumar Rajiva. And this advice is give uh, by. Uh, Fu Jian's advice, Dao An. But when at the 384 CE, when Kumar Raj was 40 years old, uh, that's the story of another story, the history, the famous battle of Fei River. Uh, Fu Jian was defeated by Eastern Jin and the Southern Empire. So he kind of like not that powerful. So the Lu Guang become a, warlo a warlord and then he already catch uh, Kumar Rajiva, but he don't want to send him back. He's so valuable. So he don't want to send him back. So he hold him uh, in prison as a war, war booty. Okay, they want to sell him for higher price. That's what he want to do. And the Lu Guang, unlike Fu Jian, he has no interest in Buddhism. So he just you know, jail uh, Kumar Rajiva. So during this period of time, Kumar Rajiva become familiar with Chinese language. Okay, he had been in jail for 17 years. So Kumar Rajiva also uh, been enforced, been forced to by the, to marry the princess of uh, uh, Kucha King. Okay, so he had to give up, forced to give up his monk's wife. So then, the, then uh, at the three ninety four. Okay, in the formal Qin, okay, uh, Fu Jian, that's the Fu family, the last name. And they have another Yao family overthrown, okay, the Fu Jian family. So the empire, the Northern Empire, become still called Qin, but the last name has been changed. Before was a Fu family, but later on at this time become Yao family. And the Yao family defeated uh, uh, Lu Guang. Okay, so he forced him to turn in. Okay, Kumar Rajiva. So Kumar Rajiva, after 70, 17 years in prison, at that time he already fifty-seven years old. He has been sent from this area, oh, from this area to Xi'an. Okay, Xi'an is today's uh, uh, the. Uh, Chang'an, okay, that's it. And today, uh, uh, Terracotta, if you want to visit the, uh, the Qin uh, Terracotta soldier, okay, so you can go over there. So uh, Kumar Rajiva started his translation work for 12 years. And when he reached 69 years old, he died in Chang'an, and also today's Xi'an. According to the legend, he, after he died, you know, all the Buddhist monk died, you put, burn it, and then they have something, only thing not burn is his tongue. Okay, so that's how smart, how talented he can speak. So, okay, that's why, you know, he, I think his tongue still left, I think. And, okay. Yes, uh, I heard it's in Japan. Oh, it's in Japan? Okay. Yeah, in Japan. <laughs> yeah, his tongue still there. Okay, so that's how smart he, how talented he is. So most of our Buddhism uh, sutra we read today okay, in China are translated by Kumar Rajiva. Um, Xuanzang usually make another translation, but their style is different. And Xuanzang is the, uh, Xuanzang is more famous, famous in his name, but his translation is only being studied in the expert, okay, but not in general. So whenever today you read the uh, Chinese uh, Buddhism Sutra, they all translated by um, uh, Kumar Rajiva. So that's how important he is. So I just list some of them, like the Lotus Sutra and Diamond Sutra. I think Alex also have interest to introduce this, uh, the one he translated. 
And the he just a little bit, uh, uh, Alex, you have something to say? Left the light on. No? So, sorry, I, I, I want you to finish and I'll, I'll say something else. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, no problem. Okay. So, uh, so that's the sutra being changed by both, uh, usually. Okay, so basically, uh, okay, so Xuan um, Zhang 200 years later also made the translation and their style is different. Okay, let, let me just briefly uh, talk about their different. Kumar Rajiva basics read the Sanskrit text and he also familiar with the Chinese language. And then he based on the meaning and the make a Chinese writing in the Chinese based on the, his understanding. And there's another, of course, you can see how difficult, you know, even we translate Chinese to English, English to Chinese, and a lot of work you cannot find the similar. So he will uh, do his best to translate. And another big problem, I don't know how, uh, have ever you read the uh, uh, Pali Sutra, okay, the Theraveda uh, text. You know, the Indian writing is, I just have to say, it's terrible. It's a keep repeating, okay. So, for example, uh, I remember one day you read is the, the disciple want to ask question to uh, Buddha. So, the disciple start to think about, okay, they have the five different to do it, the first one, and the second one, so, 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 so. how to do it on the fifth way. So, he asked Buddha. So, he, the 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 sutra is writing what the disciples think, and then he stand up, he talk to uh, Buddha, and they say, "I have a question." Okay, there's a five different way. The first one is this, the second one is the, the, the fifth one is this. How can I do on the fifth one? And the Buddha say, since they have a five different one, first one is this, second one, <laughs> the, the fifth one you should do this way. So if the same text has been repeated many times, and then he want to ask the six different methods. Then he say, okay, they have the six different methods. The first five is this, 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 and repeat one more time. So when you read this kind of text, you feel like it's page and page, and they all talk about the same thing. Only one or two sentences are different. That's the difficult part. You know, I I I, I experienced this, and and. Uh, 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 Kumar Rajiva talked about this and he uh, simplified this part. And that's, I think that's his great contribution. Even when you read today's Diamond Sutra, sometimes I also complain uh, like a lot of repetition, but I believe the original one probably even worse. That's his translation. And uh, um, Xuan Zhang's translation is a little bit different. Which is if some if you are in my uh, Dao De Jing reading or uh, Confucius and uh, like, uh, reading, I do my own translation. I'm more on the Xuanzang kind of translation. Xuanzang is doing the word by word. He try to make sure the do his best one to each one. So the language could be a little bit difficult, but more accurate. Okay, that's the two different style. So that's why we will call. Uh, Kumarajiva's translation as Chinese Buddhism, basically it's become Chinese. And the Xuanzang's translation, basically you can call it Buddhism in China because it preserved the original uh, word or meaning in Sanskrit text. So there is one uh, writing from uh, Feng Youlan okay, in chapter one. He talked about the Kumarajiva, the fifth century AD, so one of the greatest translators of Buddhism texts in Chinese, said that the work of translation is just like chewing food that is to be fed to others. If one cannot chew the food oneself, one has to give food that has already been chewed. And after an operation, however, the food is bonded to be poorer in taste and the flavor than the original. So basically you lost the flavor, but unfortunately they have no teeth and that's the only way you can do it. So uh, that's how uh, uh, Kumarajiva doing the translation and then the importance of this. So uh, Alex. Yeah. Uh, um, actually I have a little different view than, than you. I guess everybody will have different preference. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason why 
Karamajima is so uh, his his translation of Diamond Sutra, which you know I'm planning to do an in depth uh, uh, discussion later uh, this year, because uh, I I'm a fan of Diamond Sutra. I think it's great, and his translation has uh, is important in many levels. First of all, he is a ling linguist. Mm -hmm. He knows so many different languages. And he is able to, you know, draw the essence of these different languages and be able to translate uh, Diamond Sutra. And why is his translations is is the most popular? And that I personally think it's better than Xuanzang is because he was able to use very simple words, uh, simple to understand because. Buddhism is all about just like every religion, right? To they just like you said previously, to want to uh, save the general population. It's not really to doctrinize, you know, like like Christianity, you know, idolize somebody. They want to salvation. They want to uh, spread salvation. So you know, the people back then were not as educated as other people. You know, most people are, are just commoners. Uh, a worker. So, you know, in order to, to really spread the words, you have to use the simplest way to describe. But then what it's amazing about his translations is, is that he still did not lose the essence of the Diamond Sutra, that he was able to use very simple words and then to describe something very deep and profound, okay? And the way he translated, I like it because it's almost like a play. If anybody have read a little bit about the Diamond Sutra, it's basically a, 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 a gathering and people, you know, there's a dialogue between uh, the Buddha and his, uh, his uh, uh, and his, the monk questioning about, you know, many things. So, so that's why, it, his version became the best version and also well in, in many people's mind the best version and also the easiest way to assess the essence and about life and the reflection of life and that's you know and that is why you know it was so popular back then in the Tang dynasty that people would print it you know just to give away for free for other people to to read and that you know as a form of of, of spreading salvation and also the other invention that he did with the Diamond Sutra is the fact that he understands Chinese language so well that he actually wrote it in the format of Confucian uh, uh, a book of poems. You know, like the rhythm, you know, Chinese poetry has a rhythm to it. He, he understands the rhythm. He understands how to create that rhythm. So it's easy to understand, easy to remember, and even though, yeah, you said it's uh, it's repetitive, but the, that's uh, the, how what Diamond Sutra is about. It's about uh, the same thing, but many different perspectives. You know, so it seems a little bit repetitive, but it actually is you know answering from you know a little bit different uh, uh, aspect, uh, different angles. So he he his his uh his invention of this type of translation also he did not translate. Uh, 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 he translated a, a, a many, he invented, he direct translated, he transliterated, let's say, you know, a uh, 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 Bodhi, you know, he didn't say uh, the wisdom in Chinese, he just say Bodhi, right? He did, and, and that is his invention. So ever since then, people would translate the wisdom of the Buddha as the Bodhi, you know, uh, 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 and, and not a direct translation. And that was actually easier to, to people to understand that, that you don't, some things would lose in translation if you translate it directly into another language. It's almost, it would, it would take the essence. Of, so his, his invention of combining Chinese language, you know, the, po the poetry aspect of the Chinese language as well as the um, the the original word of the Buddha, you know, combine the two is is a is a great invention. Um, yeah, that's that's and uh, yeah, uh, I think that I thank you, Alex. And I see I totally agree with you. I have nothing to disagree. Okay, first about repetition. What I'm talking about is the original. I believe uh, uh, Kumar Rajiva talk about he has reduced the. Uh, repetition because <laughs> the original text even more repetition than uh, 
the uh, 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 Kumar Rajivas uh, translation. And I am not denied, okay, uh, Kumar Rajivas translation is much, much better, okay. But yeah, what but, <laughs> yeah, but, done? <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, it will be interesting to kind of look at in you know, both translations. Yeah, I try to look yeah. at and Xuanzang translation is hard to read. I, I, yeah, it's I, more theoretical. It's yeah. for scholars. Yeah. yeah. I, I talk about is myself. When I translate the uh, analects, I do in Xuanzang's style. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> the reason is this I don't have the talent of uh, uh, Kumar Rajiva. You need a great talent to do it. Yes. So, so um, I know my mom doesn't speak English when he was she was pregnant. So you know, so I <laughs> don't have this kind of talent. So okay. So uh, 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 that, that's a story. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, then we should talk about because I still need to convince uh, Pin about the Chen Buddhism is uh, originated from China, not uh, from India. So that's one of my tasks. So. Um, Okay, so let me quickly introduce uh, uh, a few Kumar Rajivas student because he translate and then uh, he has a few student and which he also introduced in Feng Yulan's book. And I, uh, yeah, each of these would be uh, require a lot of time to explain and the dandy. So let me just summarize uh, two important uh, of his student. And then I'm going to move to another person called uh, uh, Xie Lingyun, okay. So Seng Zhao, okay, is one of, they all live very short, they die at 30, 30 something, okay. So the, his writing is very difficult to read, but you know, basic, he's talking about Bu Zheng Kong Lun, which, which they, inter, he interpret empty as unreality. So he said unreal is empty. So that is so, talking about there's no real unreality. Okay, that's the first thing he talked about. And he talked about uh, another thing called on the immutality of things, which he very similar to what David Hume is talking about. You cannot, he talking about the, I look like the man of the past, but I'm not he. Okay, so he talked, the moment to moment, you the time that the thing doesn't, when the time move on, the thing doesn't move with the time. That's one part about uh, 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 empty, okay, the emptiness. That's his argument. Another one is about the uh, uh, prashna, okay, the banro, okay, the, the wisdom, okay, the high wisdom, the transcendent wisdom. Pra means uh, transcendent and sh, uh, sh, pra means transcendental uh, and the shna means uh, uh, wisdom. So he talk about the uh, prashna is not knowledge and talk about nirvana is cannot be known. So that's his argument on thing. And then uh, Dao Sheng is another uh, uh, student. Okay. So uh, he talk about the two truths all right, and he start to introduce so-called Buddhahood. Okay, so everything, everyone have Buddhahood, and he start to argue the famous when we talk about the, uh, when one sees Buddha, one is not seeing Buddha. When one see there is no Buddha, uh, one is really seeing the Buddha. Okay, so he talk about on the Dharma body is unseen. The real Buddha you cannot see. If you see, that's not real Buddha. That's he talk about, and the, the same logic. He talk about the pure land is for Buddha, and the, the word of Buddha is here, okay, not the pure land, and the, the pure land is here. This kind of uh, uh, the argument he's talking about. So, uh, but the reason I'd like to move on is in uh, about the Xie Lingyun, okay. He has been famous, if you're familiar with the Chinese literature tradition, he is famous for his uh, poetry, poem, okay. His famous people call him the landscape, uh, uh, landscape, okay. Uh, landscape poet, okay. Focus on the mountain and the streams. And unlike uh, Wang Wei, right? That's another one called the field and the garden, okay. 
or Tao Yuan Min, the time. Okay, so that's a different landscape poetry. He is the, uh, the, the originator for the mountain and the stream. So he's famous on his uh, literature, his famous poem. Okay, I think most of pe people with Chinese traditional education will know him and read some of his writing. Uh, but he also has a great contribution in the Buddhism. And that's the part uh, I want to link to Zen Buddhism. So <clears throat> he's, on from, okay, he's from the southern part. Remember, we talk about the map, the north China, northern China, and the south China. South China, we introduced two weeks ago, talk about near Taoism. And the northern China, that's the Buddhism uh, teaching. And the Kumarajwa is in Xi'an, which is in the northern China. And the Zhao Sheng and the Dao Sheng both are in the northern China. And the Xie Ling Yun actually is from the southern China, the eastern Jin. Okay. So look at his family. Okay. So his maternal, okay, during that time uh, in the southern part, because they are migrant, they are refugees from north. So it's important of your last name. So if your last name is prominent, you will always get a good job. <coughs> so Xie Lingyun, his last name is Xie. So his uh, paternal grandfather is Xie Xuan, okay, who is the one defeated uh, Fu Jian, uh, so the prime minister. And uh, his mother, also important, <coughs> is Wang, okay, Wang family. Uh, uh, his uh, maternal grandmother okay, was the daughter of uh, Wang Xizi, okay, which I believe uh, uh, Alex is going to introduce his writing, his uh, 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 calligraphy, uh, calligraphy, right? So Wang Xizi's uh, daughter is uh, Xie Lingyun's maternal grandmother. So you can see. Uh, he has been received the best of the best family education. So he's good in uh, uh, literature. And he also good in uh, his um, uh, Buddhism. He's important in Buddhism. So we introduce about Xuan Xue because he is from the southern part. So he is the uh, expert on Xuan Xue, okay, uh, which is also called the Neo Taoism. So that's his background. And then he also good at the Qingtan, so-called pure conversation. <coughs> so I think we introduced on this one uh, two weeks ago. That's his background. And then, so you can think about this person. He has a wonderful family background, great education, and he is good in the uh, near Taoism training good in the so-called Qingtan or pure conversation. Okay, so this kind of background, and he also learned the Buddhism teaching from the North. So you can see this combination and uh, people collect his Buddhist uh, writing as uh, so-called Bian Zhong Lun. And <coughs> excuse me, I, I didn't find the right translation. So I translate as discourses on the tenets of Buddhism. So over this one, he proposed, he started to write. It, he may not the person who created this idea. And then he could be the person correct and uh, you know, write down this kind of idea. So if you look at this writing, okay, the concept he talked about is what they call Dun Wu, and we call the fresh of insight or so-called sudden enlightenment. And he also a famous writing about the compromising between Buddhism and the Confucianism. And he talked about the argumentation of Taoism, the discourse of obtaining meaning. Okay. So he talked about the sage embodies nothingness. So he kind of combined the Confucian sage concept with nothingness because they already reached the devil of nothingness. And uh, this one will be very Taoism thinking. He talked about where, when one gets the meaning, the words can be forgotten. So basics, the word, the, he's talking about the wordless teaching, okay? So he started to bring the, some important concept, talking about being and non-being, language and the meaning, 
what's the meaning of learning and enlightenment, which means learning is a gradual understanding and the sudden understanding, this concept he start to write it. So he talk about the sage grasping uh, embody of the concept of nothing and become the ultimate meaning of Dun Wu, which is the sudden enlightenment while learning and the cultivation were similar temper. So talking about learning and the cultivation just simulate the temporary tool to the end. And so I think he has the one example is if you, because he is the great poet on the uh, landscape, okay, uh, poetry. Okay. So, and he specialized in the uh, so-called the mountain and the street. So I heard that he liked to, Climb mountain, okay, he's a mountain climber. So that's why he got this idea. He had to walk, you know, keep climbing and climbing. Uh, that's kind of the gradual learning, all right, gradual understand. But to the top, you want to cross the other side. If you have deep valley or gulf, you have to jump over. That's the sudden understanding. So you have to move and move as a temporary tool so to the end. Then the final point, you have to jump. That's the sudden understanding, sudden enlightenment we call Dun Wu. That's the concept he bring up. And he also start to discuss so-called Xin is my heart and what's the principle behind the Buddhahood, the principle, this kind of thing. And he put the concept of actualization, of actualize, actualization, which is uh, so-called fulfilling and reaching the limit, which is very Confucius concept. And the forgetfulness, okay? That's the Taoism concept. So if you learn to the limit, reach your limit, then you will forget what you, not what you have learned, but all the process or the tool, that just like uh, when one gets the meaning, the words can be forgotten. Okay, this kind of uh, uh, reach the limit and uh, forget it, this kind of concept. He bring up this kind of concept. So you can see he start to, because of his background, academic background, he's able to combine the Taoism, Confucianism, Confucianism and the Buddhism together. And that's he bring up. So let me quickly finish so we can have a few minutes of discussion. So, <clears throat> So basically, that's I want to talk about the influence of the Kumarajiva and how important of this one. So um, you can see, if you look at the grand scheme of the Chinese, history of the Chinese philosophy, in the warring state, let's say 300 BC, I just put the rough time, we have a six school or one tool called the Hundred School, and the, to the Han Dynasty, okay, which is about 400 years from 200 BC to 200 CE, we call it, uh, they talk about heaven, right? Mystical Confucianism, okay? Dong Zhongshu's thinking. Then to the end of Han Dynasty, people become more and more religious and they have the mystical thinking. So on the, so after that time, you know, we have the South, Southern China and the Northern China. The South, Southern China is near Taoism and Northern China is more on the uh, Chinese Buddhism, okay? So, if you see this Chinese Buddhism, then the concept Xie Lingyun bring up, right? You will see in Tang Dynasty, they start have the Zen Buddhism de developed. And his idea of the um, principle, that will become starting of, and the Buddhahood, right? So they become, uh, the concept of the principle become the Neo-Confucianism in the Song Dynasty, which is the uh, most famous person is Zhu Xi. And the, to the Ming Dynasty, another school of near Confucian come out, which based on the uh, Buddhahood and the, the mind heart concept. So you will see the this Indian, or you want to call him Indian or Kuchen. Okay? So uh, he went to China and make the translation. He created the Chinese Buddhism, which has a further influence for the Zen Buddhism and the Neo-Confucianism and the, the My Heart School of them. And the, the final part I talk about is one of the important uh, feature uh, Kumarajiva bring in is Chinese language. Uh, according to some account, probably 
I don't know that how do they count, but uh, actually it's a lot. For the person who speaks Chinese, you probably will agree. Many, many words actually is from, at least from Chinese Buddhism. Okay, I just list some of them, like even we say today, okay, convenience, okay, uh, the chance, okay, or the fate, okay, or you want to talk about it. Oh, and the causation, consequence, win, even winning, okay, as you like, this all Buddhism like language and translated in the uh, uh, Chinese Buddhism by Puma uh, Rajuba. So I think we will stop here and then uh, I hope it's not too rushed to the end part, but basics we will talk about Zen, Zen Buddhism next week. So we will have more time to discuss. So let's pause for a few minutes, 10 minutes to discussion. And before you raise your hand, I want to ask Pin, do I convince you about the Zen Buddhism is from China, not from India? Yes, you have, but I'll be a smart aleck and say there's uh, <laughs> there's no un, no real unreality. So oh, yeah, that's right. You, yeah, okay. You've convinced me and you have not convinced me at the same time. Yeah, that's the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's not to believe whatever we want to believe. So, <laughs> so uh, Adina, please. Um. Yes, my question is, um, uh, you've just covered, um, or let's say, mentioned the concept. So once you reach the ultimate, or say the, the um, you've reached some kind of um, uh, highest level, you forget the ways you reached it, the point, you you forgot um, you're forgetting all the tools and the way how you get there is that what what you've been um, uh, meaning or it's something that it's my take on that that's what i meant and that's what the uh, uh, zen buddhism is going to talk about okay so that's why when they are teaching they don't mm -hmm. write they don't teach you to read okay because whatever you read it just help you to certain point the last point you have to jump over, okay? So when you jump over, the, the tool, actually the tool is not going to help you jump over, okay? Mm, thank so you, we'll discussing on this one next week. Thank uh, you, Jason. You're welcome. Uh, Alex, please. Uh, actually, this is a comment to Pin. Uh, what I know is that how it got to Japan, how uh, Zen got popular, was uh, during the Tang Dynasty, they invited a group of uh, Japanese students from, uh, from Japan, of course, uh, to the core to study uh, Buddhism and many other literatures. Because back then, Tang Dynasty, there was a lot of cultural exchanges. And uh, Japan being uh, far behind in this regard, um, they went to the Tang, they were invited to the Tang core to study. And uh, um, that's why when they study Buddhism during the Tang Dynasty and brought it back to, to, to Japan, you know, they took away the, the Chan uh, 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 school of Buddhism. And that's how, you know, it was got a lot more popular in, in Japan. Uh, so yes, I believe Chan Buddhism is a school of, of Chinese Buddhism that, you know, is, so I, I will agree with, with Jason, I started in, 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 in China and especially popularized in, in during Tang Tang Dynasty, yeah. Yeah, if you look at the Xie Ling Yin's Bian Zhong Lun, I discuss this on the tenets of the Buddhist. It, it's a lot of flavor of uh, Zen Buddhism and at uh, that time, Zen Buddhism haven't started yet. You know, and it's really a popular. You know. Uh, yeah, well, th thank you for very much for the info, Alex. Uh, but my, my original point was there is a legend in China that uh, Zen Buddhism came from India. So yeah. it wasn't the question about Japan. It was about whether it was uh, indigenous in, in, uh, in China or it actually originally came from, from India. But I, I do agree with um, what Jason presented uh, makes a lot of sense, yeah. All right, thank you. That's the only purpose I, I, I make this presentation to, to convince you. So. <laughs> uh, 
a fear, please. Yeah, um, my question is the mystery of of Buddhism being lost in India, where it originally came from. And my my thought is like, is it because India was crowded with so much, so many religions, that it really, in a sense, is hard to compete in such a crowded market, so to speak? Or was it because it's sort of, how should I say, exporting, you know, a, a kind of almost missionary spirit to other things allowed to survive, and therefore, in a sense, paying less attention to India, surviving in the new lands, you could call it, if I want to use that as a pun, a new land, new lands, both in Southeast Asia and into China and then East Asia. Uh, because it's lucky that it did survive, because in India, well, it, it, in India is not forgotten. It's just sort of incorporated partly into the multi-religion, but it's not distinct in its own form. So I just wondered, that, that's a great mystery that it just seems interesting, was the export of it, the cause of the effect of it not surviving in India. Yeah, I think, I hope that we have some Indian expert here, you know, but... Uh... Uh, that's a, I think that's a big mystery. And there's one theory, I try to understand. One theory is um, later on, it, for sure it's popular because uh, when Xuan Zhang's writing, he talked about he went to the probably the world's first largest university, uh, so-called the, the, the Lenda School. Okay, So that's all full of um, uh, 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 Mahayana Buddhist monk. So uh, he talked about have a thousands of monks. They study all kinds of subjects, they debate over there, and he turned out to become a professor over there. So it, it could, if Xuan Zhang's writing is true, let's assume it's true, it's, it was very popular there. But why it disappeared? So it's a mystery. And some people talk about because of foreign invasion uh, later, and then kind of bring in and build the caste system, and then blah, blah. And another person talk about being just like, uh, 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 a fear talk about probably incorporate to the uh, Hinduism, or you know they find out it useless, you know, to them. You know. So we don't know. Uh, CK, please. Uh, yes, I have a, a personal story to tell. I mean, just I just want to uh, know what your thoughts on this. When I was fifteen, I was forced to study in the school uh, Buddhism. Which was who, 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 who forced you to study? Well, Buddhism? because it's part of the curriculum. I guess I, I could choose between Confucianism, Buddhism, and Christianity or Islam. Where, where, you, where, where you study? Uh, I, I studied in Singapore at the time. Oh, okay. So, so uh, you had to choose one of them. Okay. I, I would rather go out and play than, 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 than study these uh, esoteric subjects. But at the time, I, I decided that, you know. I, I, I chose Buddhism okay. and I often fell asleep during the, the class because it was extremely boring and the concepts were, were flabbergasting um, and the teacher was not very inspiring. So I spent, I spent my, my time daydreaming most of the time and then uh, for some reason I became rather philosophical at one point and I asked the teacher, uh, since you talk about emptiness, um, you know, it was given in, in, in Chinese at the time, the call, the, uh, the, uh, the course, yes, I said, uh, is this concept of emptiness eternal, right? <laughs> like the, in, in Chinese, I actually asked the question, Kong shi fou shi yong heng de. <laughs> yeah. Then the teacher basically changed the subject and refused to, uh, to answer. <laughs> uh, and so up till today, I'm wondering what, I mean, it's this whole concept part of Mahayana Buddhism, right? This this question itself seems to arise from uh, from uh, from what I, I learned from you from the okay. Mahayana tradition. Well, I, I try not to teach, but I hope you uh, you I I think you should feel lucky. You know, your teacher is not a Zen Buddhist. Otherwise, he <laughs> slap you and kick you, and then <laughs> that's a way of his teaching. So we will talk about next week. Uh, Ron, please. 
Yeah, I would say if I could be as brief as possible that in listening to all of these teachings, I see a thread that's not different in any of these. If you start with the ancient Vedas and they talk about uh, Nirguna Brahman, uh, the absolute without qualities, and then you, you go to um, uh, uh, China and you you get um, uh, uh, you get uh, the emptiness <laughs> sounds a lot like you know uh, the absolute with no qualities and then you go to Taoism and you say that emptiness without qualities you can't name it because it has no qualities so that we're, we're also talking about the same thing and then you go to Zen and of course Zen anything you name is not it. So once you understand that they're all, all of these great civilizations were uh, basically talking about the same thing and just trying to explain it in the context of the time and place that was relevant. And as somebody said, that people, ordinary people could also uh, have a chance. And once you understand that essential truth that they're all getting across and you flip over to the West and you look at Neoplatonism, you look at the pre-Socratics and so forth, you, and you look at the Christian mystics, you say, oh my God, they, they were also talking about that same thing. And uh, I think that's what, you know, um, uh, the more you study, if you, uh, you know, you let all the details and the distinctions drop off, you'll see that um, they're all talking about the one which is unnameable, unspeakable, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Actually, I, I feel the same way, you know, actually. So, you know, and actually another part of me, I was uh, very interested in ancient Greek Roman philosophy, you know, and you can, from time to time, you see the similarity and that's the interest part, personal interest. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alex. Yeah, I think Chinese Buddhism is not just about emptiness. It's about much more. Okay, but anyway, um, <laughs> I actually would like to invite Dan in this group because he's been very vocal in the chat, and he is, you know, uh, 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 I, I was wondering, Dan, if you uh, would be uh, interested to say something about your uh, Tibetan uh, uh, Buddhist. Uh, uh, um, experience and why you felt the way you felt now i would i think it would be really interested to hear sorry then i didn't see your uh, chat so uh, please you know. oh you're missing a lot <laughs> I, I, didn't see it. I was in a, i was interested in this event because uh although i've been a student and a practitioner of uh vajrayana buddhism and in particular oh. so chen for 20 years i know almost nothing about Chinese Buddhism, a Chan, Zen, or Taoism. And so when I saw uh, the event on Meetup and it turned out that I already had the book, I was very interested in learning about, uh, about Chinese Buddhism. And I very much enjoyed uh, the chapter and your presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. Then, then you then since you know the Tibetan Buddhism, can, can you contact me uh, 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 if you are interested in to talk about uh, Tibetan? Sure, Buddhism. we can uh, we can reach out to one another on Meetup. Yeah, so can you send the message to me and the Meetup uh, messaging? I will. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, thank I, you. I really, I personally, I try to study, and it's so complex, so complex. It, it is very complex. You've very, got very, very four complex. major schools, and they have very different approaches to tantra, and uh, and yet, um, what I find wonderful is that the very highest levels, all the complexity disappears, and so that's why. Uh, I want to learn more about Chan because I, as I understand it, the very highest levels of uh, Buddhist tantras are very similar to Chan. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Please contact me, and I we will be very, very proud. To have you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Dan. I just want to trouble you one quick question. I, I know sure. you, you you mentioned in the chat that you still, even though you're no longer a Tibetan Buddhist. Uh, uh, um, uh, practicing, but you still do the meditation, right? So that's I'm, correct. I'm, yeah, I'm wondering what kind of meditation uh, uh, that you do. I practice Dzogchen. Are you familiar with it? No. 
Okay, uh, that, um, that, that, that's a take this one offline. And okay. Yeah, 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 it's, 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 yeah, it's a bit uh, yeah, of an awkward uh, answer. Yeah, probably you want to send a private message to. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So you know. So. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thank you very much for this one. And uh, and anybody, just again, not only Dan or Alex. You know, if you are have a subject that you are interested, but nobody expert. Like I'm not expert. You just have a, uh, interest to learn, and you can make a presentation or discussion. And from time to time, the people who know will correct you. And that's the wonderful part uh, to host this one because you try to present what you know and the people who know better will correct you. You know, I think that's the, the life and you learn a lot. Uh, James, probably you have a final word. <laughs> I just wanted to say, even though I uh, haven't meditated for years and uh, worship nothing, I'm delivering a talk on religious logic at the Existentialist Society uh, in Australia the, uh, on, the, uh, on the September 9th. It's going to be a, uh, advertised at several groups, so uh, well, you, you can, can all the, come and hear me speak on it. Can you put the uh, link to the chat so people will know? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's see yeah. if I can get there. All right. Thank you, everyone. And then I would like to say is, okay, final word about next week, we will talk about Zen Buddhism and uh, that's included in the Feng Yolan's writing. And uh, there seems a lot of people are interested in the Buddhism and uh, the, but I try not to last too long. I know some of it definitely not interested in Buddhism. So, uh, so I will run a few, two, three weeks and uh, then we will move to the Tang Dynasty. So like next week you also talk about Damo, is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah for sure, okay. for sure, for sure. We'll talk about Damo, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, one thing, I, uh, final words about the Kuma Rajva, I forgot. Um, his translation actually, breed, personally, I feel it, he brings a lot of energy to Chinese language because I read, I don't know if Pim is thinking the same way or not. He was the ancient Chinese text and the, the text after Buddhism is very different. I can feel the energy and then also contribute a lot to the popular education because the common people are able to read. There's something to read. Otherwise, you have to read the classic. You know? So I think that's his great contribution. But anyway, uh, thank you, everyone. Have a nice weekend. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jason. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Jason. Great presentation. All right, thank see you. you next week. Yeah.